Hello everyone and welcome back again to the linear algebra component of the calculus and linear algebra series. This will be the last video that we're going to cover this week on the linear algebra topics, at least until next week where there'll be a new series of videos and a series of new topics that we're going to talk about. So let's do a brief recap of what we talked about in the last video and what also we're going to talk about in this video. Well in the last video we introduced the idea of modus ponens and modus tollens and we saw how that was related to this idea of coming up with a deductive argument within the context of propositional logic. And in this video, we're going to focus on two primary definitions. The first is this idea of whether or not P and Q are equivalent. So we're going to come up with this idea of equivalence between propositional variables. So let's recall that that was particularly useful. I said that suppose you're given a particular proposition in mathematics that's very difficult to prove. And suppose I can recast that proposition into a new proposition that's equivalent to the initial proposition, but that thing is really easy to prove. Now, if I prove that thing that's much easier to prove, that will have in turn proven the original thing because the two propositions were in fact equivalent. So this is going to be really useful to kind of expand our toolkit of things when we're going to talk about proving things within mathematics. And the second definition we're going to talk about is that of the converse of an implication statement. And we'll in fact see that this idea of a converse of the implication and the implication itself are intimately related to this idea of equivalence of propositional variables. So let's go to our first definition, which is going to be that of the equivalence of two propositional variables. So as usual, we let P and Q be propositional variables. Then we're going to say that P is equivalent to Q if P with this equivalence operator, Q, is a tautology. And just another way of reading this, this P with the equivalence operator Q is sometimes read as P if and only if Q. So that's sometimes how we might read this. And you might read this and think, well, this is a pretty weird definition for a tautology, uh, sorry, for an equivalence, because I might think of two propositional variables being equivalent if their truth values are identical, right? That's how I would like to intuitively think that two propositional variables are equivalent. Because I want to say, well, if I've given two propositional variables and I evaluate them, or I take the valuation of both of them and those truth, I, values are identical, that effectively is telling me regardless of the propositions that I put into that propositional variable, that gives me the same truth value uh, in, in all cases. And in fact, we can realize that that definition is identical to the definition I've just given now about the equivalence. So that is to say that another way of writing this definition is to say that two propositional variables are equivalent if their respective truth tables are identical. And in practice, this is going to be a much more useful way of proving whether or not two propositional variables are equivalent. The way in which we will do this is simply by just taking the valuation of one of those propositional variables, taking the valuation of another one of those propositional variables, writing them as a truth table, and seeing that the truth and false values are identical in those truth tables. And you might see, you should be able to see, looking at the definition of the uh, equivalence operator in the binary operator video that in fact these two definitions are identical right because we defined the equivalence operator to be only true if the truth values are the same so if the truth values are the same then the equivalence operator is going to be always true in other words it's a tautology and if it's a tautology that means that the truth values are always the same so we can see that these two definitions are absolutely identical but what's going to be useful now is, I said, we're going to relate this in practice to something called the converse of an implication statement. So let's look at our definition first of the converse of an implication statement. So we've got the converse of this compound proposition, which is our implication statement. We've got P implies Q. And we donate it by P with the kind of arrow flipped round by 180 degrees, Q. So in other words, we can say this is Q implies P. And it's defined by the following truth table. So as you might expect, right, well, we write out P and Q, but the converse of this thing, the converse of P implies Q, is the same as Q implies P. And we already know how to write down the implication operator. We know how to write it down in the direction of P going to Q. And we can write down it in the direction of Q going to P because we already know all the truth values inside this table. So in the first case, if we're going to write effectively Q implies P, well, we've now got Q is true and P is true. So that's going to map to true, right? Because that's what, you know, we've got that P is going to be uh, necessarily true if Q is true. But now in the previous case where we had, you know, we normally have P implies Q, this next value is normally false, right? Because we can't have a falsehood implying a truthhood. We established that in the binary operator video. But now we're going the other way around. 
we're now going from Q to P, so we're going from a falsehood to a truthhood. And recall that a falsehood can imply anything. So in fact, this next value for the converse is going to be true. Now the third value, let's look at what we've got here. We've got Q is true and P is false. So we've got a truthhood implying a falsehood, which we already know from the implication operator definition that that is a falsehood. And similarly on the last one, because Q is a falsehood, and we've already said that a falsehood can imply anything, the last value is just going to be true. So that's our definition of the converse of an implication statement. In other words, it just flips round the original implication statement. So if it starts off as P implies Q, the next thing is going to be Q implies P, or the converse is Q implies P. So the next thing to look at is we want to look at this relationship between the equivalence statement and the converse. And it comes from this remarkable theorem that we've got here, which says, let P and Q be propositional variables. And if we've got the compound proposition, which says P implies Q and Q implies P, or P, the converse of P implies Q, is in fact equivalent to P with the equivalence operator Q. Or again, we sometimes say this is P if and only if Q. So let's recall our definition of equivalence. And I said in practice, how do we prove that two things are equivalent? We take the valuation of these, of these two compound propositions and we see that the truth values of those valuations are identical. So how do we do that? We're going to take a truth table. So let's start with our truth table and we're just going to work here with the first one, which is P implies Q and uh, the converse of that Q implies P. So we start with P and Q. Again, we have all the truth values and we run over all the iterations of those. The first piece that we're going to fill in is P implies Q. Which two columns do we need to look at? As always, we just look at P and Q. And we know what all these values are, right? We know that from our binary operator video and previous videos that we've seen. So this takes true and true to true, true and false to false, false and true to true, and false and false to true. And the next piece that we're going to look at is going to be the converse. And we've just written that down a minute ago. And again, we just look at these two columns. So what does that do? It takes true and true to true, this true and false to true, false and true to false, and false and false to true. So what's the last component we need to look at now? Well, we want to look at P implies Q and its converse, Q implies P. So which components or which columns do we need to look at in this truth table to be able to fill that out? Well, now we're going to look at these two columns, right? Because we need to know what P implies Q, or at least the truth values of P implies Q and the converse are. And recall that the AND operator, when is that only true? That's true when both the truth values in those columns are also true. So in the first one, we've got P implies Q is true, and Q implies P is true, so that would map to true, right? Because we've got true and true, and the AND operator maps true and true to true. Now we've got a false in P implies Q, so that must mean the next one is false, right? Because we haven't got both of them true. Similarly, in the third row, we've got true and false, so that must map to false, because we haven't got both of them true. And in the final row, we've got true and true, they're both true, so that maps to true. Well, let's look at the true values of this table now. Well, if you look back or you know, you know, hopefully now you know what the uh, truth values are for the equivalence operator, recall that the equivalence operator was defined as exactly in the same way, right? That the equivalence operator took the value true, false, false, true. So the truth values of this thing, or at least of P implies Q and its converse, are identical to the truth values of P if and only if Q, or P equivalence operator Q. And by my definition of equivalence, that means that those two things are in fact equivalent, right? Because they're having the identical truth tables, or they, they have identical truth values in their respective columns. So we've proven that P, equivalence operator Q, is simply the same thing, the same statement as P implies Q and its converse, Q implies P. And I said, right, this is why we use this notation now of this double-sided arrow, because if we look at this thing, what we've got in our statement here is we go P implies Q, we go in one direction, and then we go back in the other direction, Q implies P. And that is identical to saying P is equivalent to Q. So this is why we use that notation of that double-sided arrow, because effectively it can be built up out of two implication arrows, right? We can take the original implication and its converse. So to finish off now, what I want to do is I want to do some examples, as always, of some particular propositions. And we'll start off with some converse examples and see how the converse works. So in this first one we're going to take, we've got uh, an if-then statement, as you might expect. So we've got P implies Q. We've got if 
it is Tuesday, then it is a weekday, what would be the converse of this? That would be if I flip it round, that would be if it is a weekday, then it is a Tuesday, right? Because I'm flipping that statement round. I've got initially P implies Q, the converse is Q implies P. For the second one, we're going to take the following. We've got if I am ill, then I cannot go to work. What would be the converse of that? That would be another word saying if I cannot go to work, then I am ill, right? So I'm just flipping around that if-then statement, and that's what the converse of that would be. And the final one is another one uh, I've got here, which is if I play tennis, then I am Roger Federer. What would be the converse? That would be if I am Roger Federer, then I play tennis. Now, in each of these examples, you might start with one that the first statement is true and you realize that the converse is false, right? So in the first example, we've got if it is Tuesday, then it is a weekday. That is indeed true. And the converse, if it is a weekday, then it is a Tuesday, is false. So we see this idea here that if I have an original statement or an implication statement is true, it isn't necessarily true that the converse is true. The only one in this case where the converse is in fact true is in three, because I've got if I play tennis, then I am Roger Federer. Well, that is false. And if I take the converse of that, if I am Roger Federer, then I play tennis is in fact true. So this is an important point here that if you take the converse of an implication statement, that is not the same as the implication statement, right? And we can see that in these examples here. So let's look at some equivalence examples. Well, when might two statements be equivalent? Well, in fact, we've seen that they're equivalent when if I start with one of them, I can get to, I can imply the next one. And if I start with the second one, I can imply the first one. So let's look at these two here. We've got the number six is even and the number six is divisible by two. So if I start with the number six is even, indeed it is true that the number six is divisible by two, right? If the number of six is even, then it is divisible by two. And if the number six is divisible by two, then it is even. So I've shown that these things are equivalent by starting with the P implies Q case and showing that Q implies P as well. And therefore that means that these two statements are in fact equivalent, as you might expect. So in this one, we've got seven is a prime number. And the second statement we're going to take is seven is only divisible by one in itself. It makes sense that these two things will be equivalent, but let's see if they're consistent with our definition. We start with seven is a prime number. Does that imply that seven is only divisible by one in itself? Yes, it does. And the other way around, if seven is only divisible by one in itself, does that mean that it's a prime number? Yes, it does. So we've proven two directions of the implication and therefore it's equivalent. And the third one, we're going to kind of take one of these cases where, where everything is false. So we've got all pigs have wings and all pigs can fly. Well, in this case, I've got all pigs have wings, which is false. And recall a falsehood can imply anything. So if I take all pigs have wings implies all pigs can fly, that is true because the initial statement was false. And if I go the other way around, all pigs can fly, which is also false, does that imply all pigs have wings? Well, it doesn't really matter because it could imply anything. That is also true. So I've shown that both directions have a truth. In other words, that these two things are indeed equivalent. So I've got a falsehood implying a falsehood and another way around falsehood implying a falsehood. So this is like that component or that piece of the equivalence operator table that said when false and false, that maps to true. This is an example of that where I have two statements that are false and therefore they are in fact equivalent, which might seem a little strange, but that is purely our definition of equivalence in this case. So that's where we're gonna finish up for this week. We've covered over the period of the week, we've introduced the idea of a proposition, propositional variables. We've introduced the idea of logical connectives, logical operators, and we brought that up into the unary operators and the binary operators. We expanded all of the binary operators, or at least the four that we're going to be looking at in this course. Introduced the idea of modus ponens, modus tollens, and saw how that relates to deductive arguments. And importantly, in this last video, has introduced this idea of equivalence of two propositional variables. And uh, as well as the converse and how that relates to the converse. And next week, we're going to expand on this even more by building up a kind of large toolkit of propositional variables that are in fact equivalent. And by doing that, that means when we're going to go on to proving things in the mathematical components of the course, we can, as I say, we can transform our propositions into equivalent propositions. And that might be incredibly useful for proving very difficult things. So thanks very much for your attention this week.
I remind you again that there's the video, uh, sorry, the, the notes on, you, um, on Moodle that you can read afterwards, and I highly recommend that, as well as doing the workshop questions uh, in the module handbook. So thanks very much for your time, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.